The Man Who Knew Too Much by G. K. Chesterton, recorded for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter Four: The Bottomless Well. In an oasis or green island in the red and yellow seas of sand that stretch beyond Europe towards the sunrise, there can be found a rather fantastic contrast, which is none the less typical of such a place since international treaties have made it an outpost of the British occupation. The site is famous among archaeologists for something that is hardly a monument, but merely a hole in the ground. But it is a round shaft like that of a well, and probably a part of some great irrigation works of remote and disputed date, perhaps more ancient than anything in that ancient land. There is a green fringe of palm and prickly pear round the black mouth of the well, but nothing of the upper masonry remains except two bulky and battered stones, standing like pillars of a gateway of nowhere, in which some of the more transcendental archaeologists in certain moods at moonrise or sunset think they can trace the faint lines of figures or features of more than Babylonian monstrosity, while the more rationalistic archaeologists in the more rational hours of daylight see nothing but two shapeless rocks. It may have been noticed, however, that all Englishmen are not archaeologists. Many of those assembled in such a place for official and military purposes have hobbies other than archaeology. And it is a solemn fact that the English in this eastern exile have contrived to make a small golf links out of the green scrub and sand, with a comfortable clubhouse at one end of it and this primeval monument at the other. They did not actually use this archaic abyss as a bunker, because it was by tradition unfathomable, and even for practical purposes unfathomed. Any sporting projectile sent into it might be counted most literally as a lost ball. But they often sauntered round it in their interludes of talking and smoking cigarettes, and one of them had just come down from the clubhouse to find another gazing somewhat moodily into the well. Both the Englishmen wore light clothes and white pith helmets and puggrees, but there, for the most part, their resemblance ended, and they both almost simultaneously said the same word, but they said it on two totally different notes of the voice. "'Have you heard the news?' asked the man from the club. "'Splendid!' "'Splendid!' replied the man by the well, but the first man pronounced the word as a young man might say it about a woman, and the second as an old man might say it about the weather, not without sincerity, but certainly without fervour. And in this the tone of the two men was sufficiently typical of them. The first, who was a certain Captain Boyle, was of a bold and boyish type, dark and with a sort of native heat in his face that did not belong to the atmosphere of the East, but rather to the ardours and ambitions of the West. The other was an older man, and certainly an older resident, a civilian official, Horn Fisher, and his drooping eyelids and drooping light moustache, all the paradox of the Englishman in the East. He was much too hot to be anything but cool. Neither of them thought it necessary to mention what it was that was splendid. That would indeed have been superfluous conversation about something that everybody knew the striking victory over a menacing combination of Turks and Arabs in the north, won by troops under the command of Lord Hastings, the veteran of so many striking victories, was already spread by the newspapers all over the empire, let alone to this small garrison so near the battlefield. Now, no other nation in the world could have done a thing like that, cried Captain Boyle emphatically. Horn Fisher was still looking silently into the well. A moment later he answered, we certainly have the art of unmaking mistakes. That's where the poor old Prussians went wrong. They could only make mistakes and stick to them. There is really a certain talent in unmaking a mistake. What do you mean? asked Boyle. What mistakes? Well, everybody knows it looked like biting off more than he could chew, replied Horn Fisher. It was a peculiarity of Mr. Fisher that he always said that everybody knew things which about one person in two million was ever allowed to hear of. And it was certainly jolly lucky that Travers turned up so well in the nick of time. Odd how often the right thing's been done for us by the second in command, even when a great man was first in command, like Colborne at Waterloo. It ought to add a whole province to the empire, observed the other. 
Well, I suppose the Zimmerns would have insisted on it as far as the canal, observed Fisher thoughtfully, though everybody knows adding provinces doesn't always pay much nowadays. Captain Boyle frowned in a slightly puzzled fashion. Being cloudily conscious of never having heard of the Zimmerns in his life, he could only remark stolidly, Well, one can't be a little Englander. Horne Fisher smiled, and he had a pleasant smile. Every man out here is a little Englander, he said. He wishes he were back in little England. I don't know what you're talking about, I'm afraid, said the younger man rather suspiciously. One would think you didn't really admire Hastings, or, or anything. I admire him no end, replied Fisher. He's by far the best man for this post. He understands the Muslims and can do anything with them. That's why I'm all against pushing Travers against him, merely because of this last affair. I really don't understand what you're driving at, said the other, frankly. Perhaps it isn't worth understanding, answered Fisher lightly. And anyhow, we needn't talk politics. Do you know the Arab legend about that well? I'm afraid I don't know much about Arab legends, said Boyle rather stiffly. That's rather a mistake, replied Fisher, especially from your point of view. Lord Hastings himself is an Arab legend. That is perhaps the very greatest thing he really is. If his reputation went, it would weaken us all over Asia and Africa. Well, the story about that hole in the ground that goes down nobody knows where has always fascinated me, rather. It's Mohammedan in form now, but I shouldn't wonder if the tale is a long way older than Mohammed. It's all about somebody they call the Sultan Aladdin, not our friend of the lamp, of course, but rather like him in having to do with genii or giants or something of that sort. They say he commanded the giants to build him a sort of pagoda, rising higher and higher above all the stars. The utmost for the highest, as the people said when they built the Tower of Babel. But the builders of the Tower of Babel were quite modest and domestic people like mice compared with old Aladdin. They only wanted a tower that would reach heaven, a mere trifle. He wanted a tower that would pass heaven and rise above it, and go on rising for ever and ever. And Allah cast him down to earth with a thunderbolt, which sank into the earth, boring a hole deeper and deeper, till it made a well that was without a bottom, as the tower was to have been without a top. And down that inverted tower of darkness, the soul of the proud sultan is falling for ever and ever. What a queer chap you are, said Boyle. You talk as if a fellow could believe those fables. Perhaps I believe the moral and not the fable, answered Fisher. But here comes Lady Hastings. You know her, I think. The clubhouse on the golf links was used, of course, for many other purposes besides that of golf. It was the only social centre of the garrison beside the strictly military headquarters. It had a billiard room and a bar and even an excellent reference library for those officers who were so perverse as to take their profession seriously. Among these was the great general himself, whose head of silver and face of bronze, like that of a brazen eagle, were often to be found bent over the charts and folios of the library. The great Lord Hastings believed in science and study, as in other severe ideals of life, and had given much paternal advice on the point to young Boyle whose appearances in that place of research were rather more intermittent. It was from one of these snatches of study that the young man had just come out through the glass doors of the library onto the golf links. But, above all, the club was so appointed as to serve the social conveniences of ladies at least as much as gentlemen, and Lady Hastings was able to play the queen in such a society almost as much as in her own ballroom. She was eminently calculated, and, as some said, eminently inclined to play such a part. She was much younger than her husband, an attractive and sometimes dangerously attractive lady. And Mr. Horne Fisher looked after her a little sardonically as she swept away with the young soldier. Then his rather dreary eye strayed to the green and prickly growths round the well, growth of that curious cactus formation in which one thick leaf grows directly out of the other without stalk or twig. It gave his fanciful mind a sinister feeling of a blind growth without shape or purpose. A flower or shrub in the west grows to the blossom which is its crown and its content. But this was as if hands could grow out of hands or legs grow out of legs in a nightmare. 
always adding a province to the empire, he said with a smile, and then added more sadly, but I doubt if I was right, after all. A strong but genial voice broke in on his meditations, and he looked up and smiled, seeing the face of an old friend. The voice was, indeed, rather more genial than the face, which was at the first glance decidedly grim. It was a typically legal face, with angular jaws and heavy, grizzled eyebrows, and it belonged to an eminently legal character, though he was now attached in a semi-military capacity to the police of that wild district. Cuthbert Grain was perhaps more of a criminologist than either a lawyer or a policeman, but in his more barbarous surroundings he had proved successful in turning himself into a practical combination of all three. The discovery of a whole series of strange oriental crimes stood to his credit. But as few people were acquainted with or attracted to such a hobby or branch of knowledge, his intellectual life was somewhat solitary. Among the few exceptions was Horne Fisher, who had a curious capacity for talking to almost anybody about almost anything. Studying botany, or is it archaeology? inquired Grain. I shall never come to the end of your interests, Fisher. I should say that what you don't know isn't worth knowing. You're wrong, replied Fisher, with a very unusual abruptness and even bitterness. It's what I do know that isn't worth knowing, all the seamy side of things, all the secret reasons and rotten motives and bribery and blackmail they call politics. I needn't be so proud of having been down all these sewers that I should brag about it to the little boys in the street. What do you mean? What's the matter with you? asked his friend. I never knew you taken like this before. I'm ashamed of myself, replied Fisher. I've just been throwing cold water on the enthusiasms of a boy. Even that explanation is hardly exhaustive, observed the criminal expert. Damned newspaper nonsense the enthusiasms were, of course, continued Fisher, but I ought to know that at that age illusions can be ideals, and they're better than the reality, anyhow. But there is one very ugly responsibility about jolting a young man out of the rut of the most rotten ideal. And what may that be? inquired his friend. It's very apt to set him off with the same energy in a much worse direction, answered Fisher, a pretty endless sort of direction, a bottomless pit as deep as the bottomless well. Fisher did not see his friend until a fortnight later, when he found himself in the garden at the back of the clubhouse on the opposite side from the links, a garden heavily coloured and scented with sweet semi-tropical plants in the glow of a desert sunset. Two other men were with him, the third being the now celebrated second-in-command, familiar to everybody as Tom Travers, a lean, dark man who looked older than his years, with a furrow in his brow and something morose about the very shape of his black moustache. They had just been served with black coffee by the Arab, now officiating as the temporary servant of the club, though he was a figure already familiar and even famous as the old servant of the general. He went by the name of Said and was notable among other Semites for that unnatural length of his yellow face and height of his narrow forehead which is sometimes seen among them, and gave an irrational impression of something sinister in spite of his agreeable smile. I never felt as if I could quite trust that fellow, said Grain, when the man had gone away. It's very unjust, I take it, for he was certainly devoted to Hastings and saved his life, they say. But Arabs are often like that, loyal to one man. I can't help feeling he might cut anybody else's throat, and even do it treacherously. Well, said Travers, with a rather sour smile, so long as he leaves Hastings alone, the world won't mind much. There was a rather embarrassing silence, full of memories of the great battle, and then Horn Fisher said, quietly, the newspapers aren't the world, Tom. Don't worry about them. Everybody in your world knows the truth well enough. I think we'd better not talk about the general just now, remarked Grain, for he's just coming out of the club. He's not coming here, said Fisher. He's only seeing his wife to the car. As he spoke, indeed, the lady came out to the steps of the club, followed by her husband, who then went swiftly in front of her to open the garden gate. As he did so, she turned back and spoke for a moment to a solitary man still sitting in a cane chair in the shadow of the doorway. The only man left in the deserted club, save for the three that lingered in the garden. 
Fisher peered for a moment into the shadow and saw that it was Captain Boyle. The next moment, rather to their surprise, the general reappeared and, remounting the steps, spoke a word or two to Boyle in his turn. Then he signalled to Said, who hurried up with two cups of coffee, and the two men re-entered the club, each carrying his cup in his hand. The next moment a gleam of white light in the growing darkness showed that the electric lamps had been turned on in the library beyond. Coffee and scientific researches, said Travers grimly. All the luxuries of learning and theoretical research. Well, I must be going, for I have my work to do as well. And he got up rather stiffly, saluted his companions, and strode away into the dusk. I only hope Boyle is sticking to scientific researches, said Horne Fisher. I'm not very comfortable about him myself, but let's talk about something else. They talked about something else longer than they probably imagined, until the tropical night had come and a splendid moon painted the whole scene with silver. But before it was bright enough to see by, Fisher had already noted that the lights in the library had been abruptly extinguished. He waited for the two men to come out by the garden entrance, but nobody came. They must have gone for a stroll on the links, he said. Very possibly, replied Grain, it's going to be a beautiful night. A moment or two after he had spoken, they heard a voice hailing them out of the shadow of the clubhouse, and were astonished to perceive Travers hurrying towards them, calling out as he came. I shall want your help, you fellows, he cried. There's something pretty bad out on the links. They found themselves plunging through the club's smoking room and the library beyond, in complete darkness, mental as well as material. But Horne Fisher, in spite of his affectation of indifference, was a person of a curious and almost transcendental sensibility to atmospheres, and he already felt the presence of something more than an accident. He collided with a piece of furniture in the library, and almost shuddered with the shock, for the thing moved as he could never have fancied a piece of furniture moving. It seemed to move like a living thing, yielding and yet striking back. The next moment Grain had turned on the lights, and he saw he had only stumbled against one of the revolving bookstands that had swung round and struck him. But his involuntary recoil had revealed to him his own subconscious sense of something mysterious and monstrous. There were several of these revolving bookcases standing here and there about the library. On one of them stood the two cups of coffee, and on another a large open book. It was Budge's book on Egyptian hieroglyphics, with coloured plates of strange birds and gods, and even as he rushed past he was conscious of something odd about the fact that this, and not any work of military science, should be open in that place at that moment. He was even conscious of the gap in the well-lined bookshelf from which it had been taken, and it seemed almost to gape at him in an ugly fashion, like a gap in the teeth of some sinister face. A run brought them in a few minutes to the other side of the ground, in front of the bottomless well, and a few yards from it, in a moonlight almost as broad as daylight, they saw what they had come to see. The great Lord Hastings lay prone on his face in a posture in which there was a touch of something strange and stiff, with one elbow erect above his body, the arm being doubled, and his big bony hand clutching the rank and ragged glass. A few feet away was Boyle, almost as motionless, supported on his hands and knees, and staring at the body. It might have been no more than shock and accident, but there was something ungainly and unnatural about the quadrupedal posture and the gaping face. It was as if his reason had fled from him. Behind there was nothing but the clear blue southern sky, and the beginning of the desert, except for the two great broken stones in front of the well and it was in such a light and atmosphere that men could fancy they traced in them enormous and evil faces looking down. Horne Fisher stooped and touched the strong hand that was still clutching the grass, and it was as cold as a stone. He knelt by the body and was busy for a moment applying other tests. Then he rose again and said with a sort of confident despair, Lord Hastings is dead. There was a stony silence, and then Travers remarked gruffly, this is your department, Grain. I'll leave you to question Captain Boyle. I can make no sense of what he says. Boyle had pulled himself together and risen to his feet, but his face still wore an awful expression, making it like a new mask or the face of another man. 
I was looking at the well, he said, and when I turned he'd fallen down. Grain's face was very dark. As you say, this is my affair, he said. I must first ask you to help me carry him to the library and let me examine things thoroughly. When they deposited the body in the library, Grain turned to Fisher and said, in a voice that had recovered its fullness and confidence, I'm going to lock myself in and make a thorough examination first. I look to you to keep in touch with the others and make a preliminary examination of Boyle. I will talk to him later. And just telephone to headquarters for a policeman and let him come here at once and stand by till I want him. Without more words, the great criminal investigator went into the lighted library, shutting the door behind him, and Fisher, without replying, turned and began to talk quietly to Travers. It is curious, he said, that the thing should happen just in front of that place. It would certainly be very curious, replied Travers, if the place played any part in it. I think, replied Fisher, that the part it didn't play is more curious still. And with these apparently meaningless words he turned to the shaken boil and, taking his arm, began to walk him up and down in the moonlight, talking in low tones. Dawn had begun to break abrupt and white when Cuthbert Grain turned out the lights in the library and came out on to the links. Fisher was lounging about alone in his listless fashion, but the police messenger for whom he had sent was standing at attention in the background. I sent Boyle off with Travers, observed Fisher carelessly. He'll look after him, and he'd better have some sleep anyhow. Did you get anything out of him, asked Grain? Did he tell you what he and Hastings were doing? Yes, answered Fisher. He gave me a pretty clear account after all. He said that after Lady Hastings went off in the car, the general asked him to take coffee with him in the library and look up a point about local antiquities. He himself was beginning to look for Budge's book in one of the revolving bookstands when the general found it in one of the bookshelves on the wall. After looking at some of the plates, they went out, it would seem rather abruptly, onto the links and walked toward the old well. And while Boyle was looking into it, he heard a thud behind him, and turned round to find the general lying as we found him. He himself dropped on his knees to examine the body, and then was paralysed with a sort of terror, and could not come nearer to it or touch it. But I think very little of that. People caught in a real shock of surprise are sometimes found in the queerest postures. Grain wore a grim smile of attention, and said, after a short silence, Well, he hasn't told you many lies. It's really a creditably clear and consistent account of what happened, with everything of importance left out. Have you discovered anything in there? asked Fisher. I have discovered everything, answered Grain. Fisher maintained a somewhat gloomy silence as the other resumed his explanation in quiet and assured tones. You were quite right, Fisher, when you said that young fellow was in danger of going down dark ways toward the pit. Whether or no, as you fancied, the jolt you gave to his view of the general had anything to do with it, he has not been treating the general well for some time. It's an unpleasant business, and I don't want to dwell on it, but it's pretty plain that his wife was not treating him well either. I don't know how far it went, but it went as far as concealment anyhow, for when Lady Hastings spoke to Boyle, it was to tell him she had hidden a note in the budge book in the library. The general overheard, or came somehow to know, and he went straight to the book and found it. He confronted Boyle with it, and they had a scene, of course. And Boyle was confronted with something else. He was confronted with an awful alternative, in which the life of one old man meant ruin, and his death meant triumph and even happiness. Well, observed Fisher at last, I don't blame him for not telling you the woman's part of the story, but how do you know about the letter? I found it on the general's body, answered Grain, but I found worse things than that. The body had stiffened in the way rather peculiar to poisons of a certain Asiatic sort. Then I examined the coffee cups, and I knew enough chemistry to find poison in the dregs of one of them. Now, the general went straight to the bookcase, leaving his cup of coffee on the bookstand in the middle of the room. While his back was turned, and Boyle was pretending to examine the bookstand, he was left alone with the coffee cup. The poison takes about ten minutes to act 
and ten minutes' walk would bring them to the bottomless well. Yes, remarked Fisher, and what about the bottomless well? What has the bottomless well got to do with it? asked his friend. It has nothing to do with it, replied Fisher. That is what I find utterly confounding and incredible. And why should that particular hole in the ground have anything to do with it? It is a particular hole in your case, said Fisher, but I won't insist on that just now. By the way, there is another thing I ought to tell you. I said I sent Boyle away in charge of Travers. It would be just as true to say I sent Travers in charge of Boyle. You don't mean to say you suspect Tom Travers, cried the other. He was a deal bitterer against the general than Boyle ever was, observed Horne Fisher with a curious indifference. Man, you're not saying what you mean, cried Grain. I tell you I found the poison in one of the coffee cups. There was always Said, of course, added Fisher, either of hatred or hire. We agreed he was capable of almost anything. And we agreed he was incapable of hurting his master, retorted Grain. Well, well, said Fisher amiably, I dare say you're right. But I should just like to have a look at the library and the coffee cups. He passed inside while Grain turned to the policeman in attendance and handed him a scribbled note to be telegraphed from headquarters. The man saluted and hurried off, and Grain, following his friend into the library, found him beside the bookstand in the middle of the room, on which were the empty cups. This is where Boyle looked for Budge, or pretended to look for him, according to your account, he said. As Fisher spoke, he bent down in a half-crouching attitude to look at the volumes in the low revolving shelf, for the whole bookstand was not much higher than an ordinary table. The next moment he sprang up as if he had been stung. Oh, my God, he cried. Very few people, if any, have ever seen Mr. Horne Fisher behave as he behaved just then. He flashed a glance at the door, saw that the open window was nearer, and went out of it with a flying leap as if over a hurdle, and went racing across the turf in the track of the disappearing policeman. Grain, who stood staring after him, soon saw his tall, loose figure returning restored to all its normal limpness of air and leisure. He was fanning himself slowly with a piece of paper, the telegram he had so violently intercepted. Lucky I stopped that, he observed. We must keep this affair as quiet as death. Hastings must die of apoplexy or heart disease. What on earth is the trouble? demanded the other investigator. The trouble is, said Fisher, that in a few days we should have had a very agreeable alternative of hanging an innocent man, or knocking the British Empire to hell. Do you mean to say, asked Grain, that this infernal crime is not to be punished? Fisher looked at him steadily. It is already punished, he said. After a moment's pause, he went on. You reconstructed the crime with admirable skill, old chap, and nearly all you said was true. Two men with two coffee cups did go into the library, and did put their cups on the bookstand, and did go together to the well, and one of them was a murderer, and had put poison in the other's cup. But it was not done while Boyle was looking at the revolving bookcase. He did look at it, though, searching for the budge book with the note in it, but I fancy that Hastings had already moved it to the shelves on the wall. It was part of that grim game that he should find it first. Now, how does a man search a revolving bookcase? He does not generally hop all round it in a squatting attitude, like a frog. He simply gives it a touch and makes it revolve. He was frowning at the floor as he spoke, and there was a light under his heavy lids that was not often seen there. The mysticism that was buried deep under all the cynicism of his experience was awake and moving in the depths. His voice took unexpected turns and inflections, almost as if two men were speaking. That was what Boyle did. He barely touched the thing, and it went round as easily as the world goes round. Yes, very much as the world goes round, for the hand that turned it was not his. God, who turns the wheel of all the stars, touched that wheel and brought it full circle, that his dreadful justice might return. I am beginning, said Grain slowly, to have some hazy and horrible idea of what you mean. It's very simple, said Fisher. 
When Boyle straightened himself from his stooping posture, something had happened which he had not noticed, which his enemy had not noticed, which nobody had noticed. The two coffee cups had exactly changed places. The rocky face of Grain seemed to have sustained a shock in silence. Not a line of it altered, but his voice, when it came out, was unexpectedly weakened. I see what you mean, he said, and, as you say, the less said about it the better. It was not the lover who tried to get rid of the husband, but the other thing. And a tale like that, about a man like that, would ruin us here. Had you any guess of this at the start? The bottomless well, as I told you, answered Fisher quietly. That was what stumped me from the start, not because it had anything to do with it, but because it had nothing to do with it. He paused a moment, as if choosing an approach, and then went on. When a man knows his enemy will be dead in ten minutes, and takes him to the edge of an unfathomable pit, he means to throw his body into it. What else should he do? A born fool would have the sense to do it, and Boyle is not a born fool. Well, why did not Boyle do it? The more I thought of it, the more I suspected that there was some mistake in the murder, so to speak. Somebody had taken somebody there to throw him in, and yet he was not thrown in. I had already an ugly, unformed idea of some substitution or reversal of parts. Then I stooped to turn the bookshelf myself, by accident, and I instantly knew everything, for I saw the two cups revolve once more like moons in the sky. After a pause, Cuthbert Grain said, And what are we to say to the newspapers? My friend Harold March is coming along from Cairo today, said Fisher. He's a very brilliant and successful journalist. But for all that, he's a thoroughly honourable man, so you must not tell him the truth. Half an hour later, Fisher was again walking to and fro in front of the clubhouse with Captain Boyle. The latter, by this time, with a very buffeted and bewildered air, perhaps a sadder and a wiser man. What about me, then? he was saying. Am I cleared? Am I not going to be cleared? I believe and hope, answered Fisher, that you are not going to be suspected, but you are certainly not going to be cleared. There must be no suspicion against him, and therefore no suspicion against you. Any suspicion against him, let alone such a story against him, would knock us endways from Malta to Mandalay. He was a hero as well as a holy terror among the Muslims. Indeed, you might almost call him a Muslim hero in the English service. Of course he got on with them, partly because of his own little dose of Eastern blood. He got it from his mother, the dancer from Damascus. Everybody knows that. Oh, repeated Boyle mechanically, staring at him with round eyes. Everybody knows that. I dare say there was a touch of it in his jealousy and ferocious vengeance, went on Fisher. But for all that, the crime would ruin us among the Arabs, all the more because it was something like a crime against hospitality. It's been hateful for you, and it's pretty horrid for me. But there are some things that damn well can't be done, and while I'm alive, that's one of them. What do you mean? asked Boyle, glancing at him curiously. Why should you, of all people, be so passionate about it? Horn Fisher looked at the young man with a baffling expression. I suppose, he said, it's because I'm a little Englander. I can never make out what you mean by that sort of thing, answered Boyle doubtfully. Do you think England is so little as all that, said Fisher, with a warmth in his cold voice, that it can't hold a man across a few thousand miles? You lectured me with a lot of ideal patriotism, my young friend, but it's practical patriotism now for you and me, with no lies to help it. You talked as if everything always went right with us, all over the world, in a triumphant crescendo culminating in Hastings. I tell you, everything has gone wrong with us here, except Hastings. He was the one name we had left to conjure with, and that mustn't go as well. No, by God, it's bad enough that a gang of infernal Jews should plant us here, where there's no earthly English interest to serve, and all hell beating up against us, simply because nosy Zimmern has lent money to half the cabinet. It's bad enough that an old pawnbroker from Baghdad should make us fight his battles. We can't fight with our right hand cut off. Our one score was Hastings and his victory, which was really somebody else's victory. Tom Travers has to suffer, and so have you. 
Then, after a moment's silence, he pointed toward the bottomless well and said, in a quieter tone, I told you that I didn't believe in the philosophy of the Tower of Aladdin. I don't believe in the empire growing until it reaches the sky. I don't believe in the Union Jack going up eternally like the Tower. But if you think I'm going to let the Union Jack go down and down eternally like the bottomless well, down into the blackness of the bottomless pit, down in defeat and derision, amid the jeers of the very Jews who have sucked us dry, no, I won't, and that's flat. Not if the Chancellor were blackmailed by twenty millionaires with their gutter rags. Not if the Prime Minister married twenty Yankee Jewesses. Not if Woodville and Carstairs had shares in twenty swindling mines. If the thing is really tottering, God help it, it mustn't be we who tip it over. Boyle was regarding him with a bewilderment that was almost fear, and had even a touch of distaste. Somehow, he said, there seems to be something rather horrid about the things you know. There is, replied Horne Fisher. I am not at all pleased with my small stock of knowledge and reflection. But as it is partly responsible for your not being hanged, I don't know that you need complain of it. And as if a little ashamed of his first boast, he turned and strolled away toward the bottomless well. End of chapter The Man Who Knew Too Much by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Chapter 5 The Fad of the Fisherman A thing can sometimes be too extraordinary to be remembered. If it is clean out of the course of things, and has apparently no causes and no consequences, subsequent events do not recall it, and it remains only a subconscious thing, to be stirred by some accident long after. It drifts apart like a forgotten dream. And it was in the hour of many dreams, at daybreak and very soon after the end of dark, that such a strange sight was given to a man sculling a boat down a river in the West Country. The man was awake, indeed he considered himself rather wide awake, being the political journalist Harold March, on his way to interview various political celebrities in their country seats. But the thing he saw was so inconsequent that it might have been imaginary. It simply slipped past his mind and was lost in later and utterly different events. Nor did he even recover the memory till he had long afterward discovered the meaning. Pale mists of morning lay on the fields and the rushes along one margin of the river. Along the other side ran a wall of tawny brick almost overhanging the water. He had shipped his oars and was drifting for a moment with the stream when he turned his head and saw that the monotony of the long brick wall was broken by a bridge, rather an elegant eighteenth-century sort of bridge with little columns of white stone turning grey. There had been floods, and the river still stood very high, with dwarfish trees waist-deep in it, and rather a narrow arc of white dawn gleamed under the curve of the bridge. As his own boat went under the dark archway, he saw another boat coming toward him rowed by a man as solitary as himself. His posture prevented much being seen of him, but as he neared the bridge he stood up in the boat and turned round. He was already so close to the dark entry, however, that his whole figure was black against the morning light, and March could see nothing of his face except the end of two long whiskers or moustaches that gave something sinister to the silhouette, like horns in the wrong place. Even these details March would never have noticed, but for what happened in the same instant. As the man came under the low bridge, he made a leap at it and hung with his legs dangling, letting the boat float away from under him. March had a momentary vision of two black kicking legs, then of one black kicking leg, and then of nothing except the eddying stream and the long perspective of the wall. But whenever he thought of it again, long afterwards, when he understood the story in which it figured, it always fixed in that one fantastic shape, as if those wild legs were a grotesque, graven ornament of the bridge itself in the manner of a gargoyle. At the moment he merely passed, staring down the stream. He could see no flying figure on the bridge, so it must have already fled. But he was half conscious of some faint significance in the fact that among the trees round the bridgehead opposite the wall he saw a lamp-post, and, beside the lamp-post, 
the broad blue back of an unconscious policeman. Even before reaching the shrine of his political pilgrimage, he had many other things to think of besides the odd incident of the bridge. The management of a boat by a solitary man was not always easy, even on such a solitary stream. And indeed, it was only by an unforeseen accident that he was solitary. The boat had been purchased and the whole expedition planned in conjunction with a friend, who had at the last moment been forced to alter all his arrangements. Harold March was to have travelled with his friend Horn Fisher on that inland voyage to Willowwood Place, where the Prime Minister was a guest at the moment. More and more people were hearing of Harold March, for his striking political articles were opening to him the doors of larger and larger salons. But he had never met the Prime Minister yet. Scarcely anybody among the general public had ever heard of Horn Fisher. But he had known the Prime Minister all his life. For these reasons, had the two taken the projected journey together, March might have been slightly disposed to hasten it, and Fisher vaguely content to lengthen it out. For Fisher was one of those people who are born knowing the Prime Minister. The knowledge seemed to have no very exhilarant effect, and in his case bore some resemblance to being born tired. But he was distinctly annoyed to receive, just as he was doing a little light packing of fishing tackle and cigars for the journey, a telegram from Willowwood asking him to come down at once by train, as the Prime Minister had to leave that night. Fisher knew that his friend the journalist could not possibly start till the next day, and he liked his friend the journalist and had looked forward to a few days on the river. He did not particularly like or dislike the Prime Minister, but he intensely disliked the alternative of a few hours in the train. Nevertheless, he accepted Prime Ministers as he accepted railway trains, as part of a system which he, at least, was not the revolutionist sent on earth to destroy. So he telephoned to March, asking him, with many apologetic courses and faint dams, to take the boat down the river as arranged, that they might meet at Willowwood by the time settled. Then he went outside and hailed a taxicab to take him to the railway station. There he paused at the bookstall to add to his light luggage a number of cheap murder stories, which he read with great pleasure, and without any premonition that he was about to walk into as strange a story in real life. A little before sunset he arrived, with his light suitcase in hand, before the gate of the long riverside gardens of Willowwood Place, one of the smaller seats of Sir Isaac Hook, the master of much shipping and many newspapers. He entered by the gate giving on the road at the opposite side to the river, but there was a mixed quality in all that watery landscape which perpetually reminded a traveller that the river was near. White gleams of water would shine suddenly like swords or spears in the green thickets. And even in the garden itself, divided into courts and curtained with hedges and high garden trees, there hung everywhere in the air the music of water. The first of the green courts which he entered appeared to be a somewhat neglected croquet lawn, in which was a solitary young man playing croquet against himself. Yet he was not an enthusiast for the game, or even for the garden, and his sallow but well-featured face looked rather sullen than otherwise. He was only one of those young men who cannot support the burden of consciousness unless they are doing something, and whose conceptions of doing something are limited to a game of some kind. He was dark and well-dressed in a light holiday fashion, and Fisher recognised him at once as a young man named James Bullen called for some unknown reason Bunker. He was the nephew of Sir Isaac, but what was much more important at that moment, he was also the private secretary of the Prime Minister. Hello, Bunker, observed Horn Fisher. You're the sort of man I wanted to see. Has your chief come down yet? He's only staying for dinner, replied Bullen, with his eye on the yellow ball. He's got a great speech tomorrow at Birmingham, and he's going straight through tonight. He's motoring himself there, driving the car, I mean. It's the one thing he's really proud of. You mean you're staying here with your uncle like a good boy, replied Fisher. But what will the chief do at Birmingham without the epigrams whispered to him by his brilliant secretary? Don't you start ragging me, said the young man called Bunker. I'm only too glad not to go trailing after him. He doesn't know a thing about maps or money or hotels or anything, and I have to dance about like a courier. 
As for my uncle, as I'm supposed to come into the estate, it's only decent to be here sometimes. Very proper, replied the other. Well, I shall see you later on. And crossing the lawn, he passed out through a gap in the hedge. He was walking across the lawn toward the landing stage on the river, and still felt all around him, under the dome of golden evening, an old world savour and reverberation in that river-haunted garden. The next square of turf which he crossed seemed at first sight quite deserted, till he saw in the twilight of trees in one corner of it a hammock, and in the hammock a man reading a newspaper and swinging one leg over the edge of the net. Him also he hailed by name and the man slipped to the ground and strolled forward. It seemed fated that he should feel something of the past in the accidents of that place, for the figure might well have been an early Victorian ghost revisiting the ghosts of the croquet hoops and mallets. It was the figure of an elderly man with long whiskers that looked almost fantastic, and a quaint and careful cut of collar and cravat. Having been a fashionable dandy forty years ago, he had managed to preserve the dandyism while ignoring the fashions. A white top hat lay beside the morning post in the hammock behind him. This was the Duke of Westmoreland, the relic of a family really some centuries old, and the antiquity was not heraldry but history. Nobody knew better than Fisher how rare such noblemen are, in fact, and how numerous in fiction. But whether the Duke owed the general respect he enjoyed to the genuineness of his pedigree, or to the fact that he owned a vast amount of very valuable property, was a point about which Mr. Fisher's opinion might have been more interesting to discover. "'You were looking so comfortable,' said Fisher, "'that I thought you must be one of the servants. I'm looking for somebody to take this bag of mine. I haven't brought a man down as I came away in a hurry.' "'Nor have I, for that matter,' replied the Duke, with some pride. "'I never do. If there's one animal alive I loathe, it's a valet. I learned to dress myself at an early age, and was supposed to do it decently. I may be in my second childhood, but I have not got so far as being dressed like a child. "'The Prime Minister hasn't brought a valet. He's brought a secretary instead,' observed Fisher. "'Devilish inferior job. Didn't I hear that Harker was down here?' He's over there on the landing stage, replied the Duke, indifferently, and resumed the study of the morning post. Fisher made his way beyond the last green wall of the garden, on to a sort of towing path looking on the river and a wooden island opposite. There, indeed, he saw a lean, dark figure with a stoop almost like that of a vulture, a posture well known in the law courts as that of Sir John Harker, the Attorney General. His face was lined with headwork. For alone, among the three idlers in the garden, he was a man who had made his own way. And round his bald brow and hollow temples clung dull red hair, quite flat like plates of copper. "'I haven't seen my host yet,' said Horne Fisher, in a slightly more serious tone than he had used to the others. "'But I suppose I shall meet him at dinner.' "'You can see him now, but you can't meet him,' answered Harker. He nodded his head toward one end of the island opposite, and looking steadily in the same direction, the other guest could see the dome of a bald head and the top of a fishing rod, both equally motionless, rising out of the tall undergrowth against the background of the stream beyond. The fisherman seemed to be seated against the stump of a tree and facing toward the other bank, so that his face could not be seen, but the shape of his head was unmistakable. He doesn't like to be disturbed when he's fishing, continued Harker. It's a sort of fad of his to eat nothing but fish, and he's very proud of catching his own. Of course, he's all for simplicity, like so many of these millionaires. He likes to come in saying he's worked for his daily bread like a labourer. Does he explain how he blows all the glass and stuffs all the upholstery, asked Fisher, and makes all the silver forks, and grows all the grapes and peaches, and designs all the patterns on the carpets? I've always heard he was a busy man. I don't think he mentioned it, answered the lawyer. What is the meaning of this social satire? Well, I'm a trifle tired, said Fisher, of the simple life and the strenuous life as lived by our little set. We're all really dependent in nearly everything, and we all make a fuss about being independent in something. 
The Prime Minister prides himself on doing without a chauffeur, but he can't do without a factotum and jack-of-all-trades. And poor old Bunker has to play the part of a universal genius, which God knows he was never meant for. The Duke prides himself on doing without a valet, but for all that he must give a lot of people an infernal lot of trouble to collect such extraordinary old clothes as he wears. He must have them looked up in the British Museum or excavated out of the tombs. That white hat alone must require a sort of expedition fitted out to find it, like the North Pole. And here we have old Hook pretending to produce his own fish when he couldn't produce his own fish knives or fish forks to eat it with. He may be simple about simple things like food, but you bet he's luxurious about luxurious things, especially little things. I don't include you. You've worked too hard to enjoy playing at work. I sometimes think, said Harker, that you conceal a horrid secret of being useful sometimes. Haven't you come down here to see number one before he goes to Birmingham? Horn Fisher answered in a lower voice. Yes, and I hope to be lucky enough to catch him before dinner. He's got to see Sir Isaac about something just afterwards. Hello, exclaimed Harker. Sir Isaac's finished his fishing. I know he prides himself on getting up at sunrise and going in at sunset. The old man on the island had indeed risen to his feet, facing round and showing a bush of grey beard with rather small, sunken features, but fierce eyebrows and keen, choleric eyes. Carefully carrying his fishing tackle, he was already making his way back to the mainland across a bridge of flat stepping stones, a little way down the shallow stream. Then he veered round, coming towards his guests and civilly saluting them. There were several fish in his basket, and he was in a good temper. Yes, he said, acknowledging Fisher's polite expression of surprise. I get up before anybody else in the house, I think. The early bird catches the worm. Unfortunately, said Harker, it is the early fish that catches the worm. But the early man catches the fish, replied the old man gruffly. But from what I hear, Sir Isaac, you're the late man too, interposed Fisher. You do with very little sleep. I never had much time for sleeping, answered Hook, and I shall have to be the late man tonight anyhow. The Prime Minister wants to have a talk, he tells me, and all things considered, I think we'd better be dressing for dinner. Dinner passed off that evening without a word of politics, and little enough but ceremonial trifles. The Prime Minister, Lord Merivale, who was a long, slim man with curly grey hair, was gravely complimentary to his host about his success as a fisherman and the skill and patience he displayed. The conversation flowed like the shallow stream through the stepping stones. It wants patience to wait for them, no doubt, said Sir Isaac, and skill to play them but I'm generally pretty lucky at it. Does a big fish ever break the line and get away? inquired the politician with respectful interest. Not the sort of line I use, answered Hook with satisfaction. I rather specialise in tackle, as a matter of fact. If he were strong enough to do that, he'd be strong enough to pull me into the river. A great loss to the community, said the Prime Minister, bowing. Fisher had listened to all these futilities with inward impatience, waiting for his own opportunity, and when the host rose he sprang to his feet with an alertness he rarely showed. He managed to catch Lord Merivale before Sir Isaac bore him off for the final interview. He had only a few words to say, but he wanted to get them said. He said, in a low voice as he opened the door for the Premier, I've seen Montmirail. He says that unless we protest immediately on behalf of Denmark, Sweden will certainly seize the ports. Lord Merivale nodded. I'm just going to hear what Hook has to say about it, he said. I imagine, said Fisher with a faint smile, that there is very little doubt what he will say about it. Merivale did not answer, but lounged gracefully toward the library, whither his host had already preceded him. The rest drifted toward the billiard room, Fisher merely remarking to the lawyer, They won't be long. We know they're practically in agreement. Hook entirely supports the Prime Minister, assented Harker. Or the Prime Minister entirely supports Hook, said Horn Fisher, and began idly to knock the balls about on the billiard table. Horn Fisher came down next morning in a late and leisurely fashion, as was his reprehensible habit, 
he had evidently no appetite for catching worms. But the other guests seemed to have felt a similar indifference, and they helped themselves to breakfast from the sideboard at intervals during the hours verging upon lunch. So it was not many hours later when the first sensation of that strange day came upon them. It came in the form of a young man with light hair and a candid expression, who came sculling down the river and disembarked at the landing stage. It was, in fact, no other than Mr. Harold March, whose journey had begun far away up the river in the earliest hours of that day. He arrived late in the afternoon, having stopped for tea in a large riverside town, and he had a pink evening paper sticking out of his pocket. He fell on the riverside garden like a quiet and well-behaved thunderbolt. But he was a thunderbolt without knowing it. The first exchange of salutations and introductions was commonplace enough, and consisted indeed of the inevitable repetition of excuses for the eccentric seclusion of the host. He had gone fishing again, of course, and must not be disturbed till the appointed hour, though he sat within a stone's throw of where they stood. You see, it's his only hobby, observed Harker apologetically, and after all it's his own house, and he's very hospitable in other ways. I'm rather afraid, said Fisher, in a lower voice, that it's becoming more of a mania than a hobby. I know how it is when a man of that age begins to collect things, if it's only collecting those rotten little river fish. You remember Talbot's uncle with his toothpicks and poor old Buzzy and the waste of cigar ashes? Hook has done a lot of big things in his time. The great deal in the Swedish timber trade and the peace conference at Chicago. But I doubt whether he cares now for any of those big things as he cares for those little fish. Oh, come, come, protested the Attorney General. You'll make Mr. March think he's come to call on a lunatic. Believe me, Hook only does it for fun like any other sport, only he's of the kind that takes his fun sadly. But I bet if there were big news about timber or shipping he would drop his fun and his fish all right. Well, I wonder, said Horn Fisher, looking sleepily at the island in the river. By the way, is there any news of anything? asked Harker of Harold March. I see you've got an evening paper, one of those enterprising evening papers that come out in the morning. The beginning of Lord Merivale's Birmingham speech, replied March, handing him the paper. It's only a paragraph, but it seemed to me rather good. Harker took the paper, flapped and refolded it, and looked at the stop press news. It was, as March had said, only a paragraph, but it was a paragraph that had a peculiar effect on Sir John Harker. His lowering brows lifted with a flicker, and his eyes blinked, and for a moment his leathery jaw was loosened. He looked in some odd fashion like a very old man. Then, hardening his voice and handing the paper to Fisher without a tremor, he simply said, Well, here's a chance for the bet. You've got your big news to disturb the old man's fishing. Horn Fisher was looking at the paper, and over his more languid and less expressive features a change also seemed to pass. Even that little paragraph had two or three large headlines, and his eyes encountered Sensational Warning to Sweden, and We Shall Protest. What the devil, he said, and his words softened first to a whisper and then a whistle. We must tell old Hook at once, or he'll never forgive us, said Harker. He'll probably want to see number one instantly, though it may be too late now. I'm going across to him at once. I bet I'll make him forget his fish, anyhow. And turning his back, he made his way hurriedly along the riverside to the causeway of flat stones. March was staring at Fisher in amazement at the effect his pink paper had produced. What does it all mean? he cried. I always supposed we should protest in defence of the Danish ports, for their sakes and our own. What is all this botheration about Sir Isaac and the rest of you? Do you think it bad news? Bad news, repeated Fisher, with a sort of soft emphasis beyond expression. Is it as bad as all that? asked his friend at last. As bad as all that, repeated Fisher. Why, of course, it's as good as it can be. It's great news. It's glorious news. That's where the devil of it comes in, to knock us all silly. It's admirable. It's inestimable. It's also quite incredible. He gazed again at the grey and green colours of the island and the river, and his rather dreary eye travelled slowly round to the hedges and the lawns. 
I felt this garden was a sort of dream, he said, and I suppose I must be dreaming. But there is grass growing and water moving, and something impossible has happened. Even as he spoke, the dark figure with a stoop like a vulture appeared in the gap of the hedge just above him. You've won your bet, said Harker, in a harsh and almost croaking voice. The old fool cares for nothing but fishing. He cursed me and told me he would talk no politics. I thought it might be so, said Fisher modestly. What are you going to do next? I shall use the old idiot's telephone anyhow, replied the lawyer. I must find out exactly what has happened. I've got to speak for the government myself tomorrow. And he hurried away toward the house. In the silence that followed, a very bewildering silence so far as March was concerned, they saw the quaint figure of the Duke of Westmoreland with his white hat and whiskers approaching them across the garden. Fisher instantly stepped toward him with the pink paper in his hand, and with a few words pointed out the apocalyptic paragraph. The Duke, who had been walking slowly, stood quite still, and for some seconds he looked like a tailor's dummy standing and staring outside some antiquated shop. Then March heard his voice, and it was high and almost hysterical. But he must see it, he must be made to understand, it cannot have been put to him properly. Then, with a certain recovery of fullness and even pomposity in the voice, I shall go and tell him myself. Among the queer incidents of that afternoon, March always remembered something almost comical about the clear picture of the old gentleman in his wonderful white hat, carefully stepping from stone to stone across the river, like a figure crossing the traffic in Piccadilly. Then he disappeared behind the trees of the island, and March and Fisher turned to meet the Attorney General, who was coming out of the house with a visage of grim assurance. Everybody is saying, he said, that the Prime Minister has made the greatest speech of his life, peroration and loud and prolonged cheers. Corrupt financiers and heroic peasants, we will not desert Denmark again. Fisher nodded and turned away toward the towing path, where he saw the Duke returning with a rather dazed expression. In answer to questions, he said in a husky and confidential voice, I really think our poor friend cannot be himself. He refused to listen. He uh, suggested that I might frighten the fish. A keen ear might have detected a murmur from Mr. Fisher on the subject of a white hat but Sir John Harker struck it more decisively. Fisher was quite right. I didn't believe it myself, but it's quite clear that the old fellow is fixed on his fishing notion by now. If the house caught fire behind him, he would hardly move till sunset. Fisher had continued his stroll toward the higher embanked ground of the towing path, and he now swept a long and searching gaze not toward the island, but toward the distant wooded heights that were the walls of the valley. An evening sky as clear as that of the previous day was settling down all over the dim landscape, but toward the west it was now red rather than gold. There was scarcely any sound but the monotonous music of the river. Then came the sound of a half-stifled exclamation from Horn Fisher, and Harold March looked up at him in wonder. You spoke of bad news, said Fisher. Well, there is really bad news now. I'm afraid this is a bad business. What bad news do you mean? asked his friend, conscious of something strange and sinister in his voice. The sun has set, answered Fisher. He went on with the air of one conscious of having said something fatal. We must get somebody to go across whom he will really listen to. He may be mad, but there's method in his madness. There nearly always is method in madness. It's what drives men mad, being methodical. And he never goes on sitting there after sunset, with the whole place getting dark. Where's his nephew? I believe he's really fond of his nephew. Look, cried March abruptly, why he's been across already. There he is coming back. And looking up the river once more, they saw, dark against the sunset reflections, the figure of James Bullen stepping hastily and rather clumsily from stone to stone. Once he slipped on a stone with a slight splash. When he rejoined the group on the bank, his olive face was unnaturally pale. The other four men had already gathered on the same spot, and almost simultaneously were calling out to him, What does he say now? 
Nothing. He says, nothing. Fisher looked at the young man steadily for a moment. Then he started from his immobility, and, making a motion to March to follow him, himself strode down to the river crossing. In a few moments they were on the little beaten track that ran round the wooded island to the other side of it, where the fisherman sat. Then they stood and looked at him, without a word. Sir Isaac Hook was still sitting propped up against the stump of the tree, and that for the best of reasons. A length of his own infallible fishing line was twisted and tightened, twice round his throat, then twice round the wooden prop behind him. The leading investigator ran forward and touched the fisherman's hand, and it was as cold as a fish. The sun has set, said Horn Fisher in the same terrible tones, and he will never see it rise again. Ten minutes afterwards the five men, shaken by such a shock, were again together in the garden, looking at one another with white but watchful faces. The lawyer seemed the most alert of the group. He was articulate, if somewhat abrupt. We must leave the body as it is, and telephone for the police, he said. I think my own authority will stretch to examining the servants and the poor fellow's papers to see if there is anything that concerns them. Of course, none of you gentlemen must leave this place. Perhaps there was something in his rapid and rigorous legality that suggested the closing of a net or trap. Anyhow, young Bullen suddenly broke down, or perhaps blew up, for his voice was like an explosion in the silent garden. I never touched him, he cried. I swear I had nothing to do with it. Who said you had? demanded Harker with a hard eye. Why do you cry out before you're hurt? Because you all look at me like that, cried the young man angrily. Do you think I don't know you're always talking about my damned debts and expectations? Rather to March's surprise, Fisher had drawn away from this first collision, leading the Duke with him to another part of the garden. When he was out of earshot of the others, he said with a curious simplicity of manner, Westmoreland, I'm going straight to the point. Well, said the other, staring at him stolidly. You have a motive for killing him, said Fisher. The Duke continued to stare, but he seemed unable to speak. I hope you had a motive for killing him, continued Fisher mildly. You see, it's rather a curious situation. If you have a motive for murdering, you probably didn't murder. But if you hadn't any motive, why then perhaps you did. What on earth are you talking about? demanded the Duke violently. It's quite simple, said Fisher. When you went across, he was either alive or dead. If he was alive, it might be you who killed him. Or why should you have held your tongue about his death? But if he was dead, and you had a reason for killing him, you might have held your tongue for fear of being accused. Then after a silence, he added abstractedly, Cyprus is a beautiful place, I believe, romantic scenery and romantic people, very intoxicating for a young man. The Duke suddenly clenched his hands and said thickly, Well, I had a motive. Then you're all right, said Fisher, holding out his hand with an air of huge relief. I was pretty sure you wouldn't really do it. You had a fright when you saw it done, as was only natural, like a bad dream come true, wasn't it? While this curious conversation was passing, Harker had gone into the house, disregarding the demonstrations of the sulky nephew, and came back presently with a new air of animation and a sheaf of papers in his hand. I've telephoned for the police, he said, stopping to speak to Fisher, but I think I've done most of their work for them. I believe I've found out the truth. There's a paper here, he stopped, for Fisher was looking at him with a singular expression, and it was Fisher who spoke next. Are there any papers that are not there, I wonder, I mean, that are not there now? After a pause, he added, let us have the cards on the table. When you went through his papers in such a hurry, Harker, weren't you looking for something to... to make sure it shouldn't be found? Harker did not turn a red hair on his hard head, but he looked at the other out of the corners of his eyes. And, I suppose, went on Fisher smoothly, that is why you, too, told us lies about having found Hook alive. You knew there was something to show that you might have killed him, and you didn't dare tell us he was killed. But, believe me, it's much better to be honest now. 
Harker's haggard face suddenly lit up as if with infernal flames. Honest, he cried, it's not so damn fine of you fellows to be honest. You're all born with silver spoons in your mouths, and then you swagger about with everlasting virtue because you haven't got other people's spoons in your pockets. But I was born in a Pimlico lodging house, and I had to make my spoon, and there'd be plenty to say I only spoiled a horn or an honest man. And if a struggling man staggers a bit over the line in his youth, in the lower parts of the law, which are pretty dingy anyhow, there's always some old vampire to hang on to him all his life for it. Guatemala and Golcondas, wasn't it? said Fisher sympathetically. Harker suddenly shuddered. Then he said, I believe you must know everything, like God Almighty. I know too much, said Horn Fisher, and all the wrong things. The other three men were drawing nearer to them. But before they came too near, Harker said, in a voice that had recovered all its firmness, Yes, I did destroy a paper, but I really did find a paper too, and I believe that it clears us all. Very well, said Fisher, in a louder and more cheerful tone. Let us all have the benefit of it. On the very top of Sir Isaac's papers, explained Harker, there was a threatening letter from a man named Hugo. It threatens to kill our unfortunate friend very much in the way that he was actually killed. It is a wild letter full of taunts, you can see it for yourselves, but it makes a particular point of poor Hook's habit of fishing from the island. Above all, the man professes to be writing from a boat, and since we alone went across to him, and he smiled in a rather ugly fashion, the crime must have been committed by a man passing in a boat. Why, dear me, cried the Duke, with something almost amounting to animation. Why, I remember the man called Hugo quite well. He was a sort of body-servant and bodyguard of Sir Isaac. You see, Sir Isaac was in some fear of assault. He was, he was not very popular with several people. Hugo was discharged after some row or other. But I remember him well. He was a great big Hungarian fellow with great moustaches that stood out on each side of his face. A door opened in the darkness of Harold March's memory, or rather oblivion and showed a shining landscape like that of a lost dream. It was rather a waterscape than a landscape, a thing of flooded meadows and low trees, and the dark archway of a bridge. And for one instant he saw again the man with moustaches like dark horns leap up onto the bridge and disappear. Good heavens, he cried, why, I met the murderer this morning. Horn Fisher and Harold March had their day on the river after all. The little group broke up when the police arrived. They declared that the coincidence of March's evidence had cleared the whole company, and clinched the case against the flying Hugo. Whether that Hungarian fugitive would ever be caught appeared to Horn Fisher to be highly doubtful. Nor can it be pretended that he displayed any very demoniac detective energy in the matter, as he leaned back in the boat cushions, smoking, and watching the swaying reeds slide past. It was a very good notion to hop up onto the bridge, he said. An empty boat means very little. He hasn't been seen to land on either bank, and he's walked off the bridge without walking onto it, so to speak. He's got twenty-four hours start, his moustaches will disappear, and then he will disappear. I think there is every hope of his escape. Hope, repeated March, and stopped sculling for an instant. Yes, hope, repeated the other. To begin with, I'm not going to be exactly consumed with Corsican revenge because somebody has killed Hook. Perhaps you may guess by this time what Hook was. A damned blood-sucking blackmailer was that simple, strenuous, self-made captain of industry. He had secrets against nearly everybody. One against poor old Westmoreland about an early marriage in Cyprus that might have put the Duchess in a queer position and one against Harker about some flutter with his client's money when he was a young solicitor. That's why they went to pieces when they found him murdered, of course. They felt as if they'd done it in a dream. But I admit I have another reason for not wanting our Hungarian friend actually hanged for the murder. And what is that? asked his friend. Only that he didn't commit the murder, answered Fisher. Harold March laid down the oars and let the boat drift for a moment. Do you know, I was half expecting something like that, he said. It was quite irrational, but it was hanging about in the atmosphere like thunder in the air. On the contrary, it's finding Hugo guilty that's irrational, replied Fisher. 
Don't you see that they're condemning him for the very reason for which they acquit everybody else? Harker and Westmoreland were silent because they found him murdered, and knew there were papers that made them look like the murderers. Well, so did Hugo find him murdered, and so did Hugo know there was a paper that would make him look like the murderer. He had written it himself the day before. But in that case, said March, frowning, at what sort of unearthly hour in the morning was the murder really committed? It was barely daylight when I met him at the bridge, and that's some way above the island. The answer is very simple, replied Fisher. The crime was not committed in the morning. The crime was not committed on the island. March stared at the shining water without replying, but Fisher resumed like one who has been asked a question. Every intelligent murder involves taking advantage of some one uncommon feature in a common situation. The feature here was the fancy of old Hook for being the first man up every morning, his fixed routine as an angler, and his annoyance at being disturbed. The murderer strangled him in his own house after dinner on the night before, carried his corpse with all his fishing tackle across the stream in the dead of night, tied him to the tree, and left him there under the stars. It was a dead man who sat fishing there all day. Then the murderer went back to the house, or rather to the garage, and went off in his motor car. The murderer drove his own motor car. Fisher glanced at his friend's face and went on. You look horrified, and the thing is horrible, but other things are horrible too. If some obscure man had been hag-ridden by a blackmailer, and had his family life ruined, you wouldn't think the murder of his persecutor the most inexcusable of murders. Is it any worse when a whole great nation is set free as well as a family? By this warning to Sweden we shall probably prevent war and not precipitate it, and save many thousand lives, rather more valuable than the life of that viper. Oh, I'm not talking sophistry or seriously justifying the thing, but the slavery that held him and his country was a thousand times less justifiable. If I had really been sharp, I should have guessed it from his smooth, deadly smiling at dinner that night. Do you remember that silly talk about how old Isaac could always play his fish? In a pretty hellish sense, he was a fisher of men. Harold March took the oars and began to row again. I remember, he said, and about how a big fish might break the line and get away. End of chapter